Goja 3 is a little stuffy for Riker's taste. A prisoner has escaped from a penal colony on Lunar 5, and Roga Danar's first instructor called himself a counselor. Hello, everybody, and welcome to The Seventh Rule with Sirach Lofton. Hello, hello. My name is Ryan T. Husk, and today, you may have guessed, we are doing a review of Star Trek The Next Generation Season 3, Episode 11, The Hunted, written by Robin Bernheim, directed by Cliff Bowl, our pal. Uh, this was January 8th, 1990. Put your Oakleys away. Where were you? What's up, Sirach? How are you today? I'm all right. I'm good. All right. Uh, before we get it too far into this episode, everybody, this is your last chance to go to Trek to San Francisco. Creation Entertainment presents Trek to San Francisco, hashtag STSF, dozens of Star Trek guests, including, you're not going to believe this, Sirach Lofton. <laughs> Come on. Sirach yeah. Lofton's going to be there. I'm going to be there. Melissa Longo is going to be there. A lot of our friends and family are going to be there. Lots of cool Trek celebrities. Tons of fun. Go to creationent.com. That's creationent.com. But you got to hurry. This is March 8th through 10th in San Francisco area, right across the street, basically, from the San Francisco airport. It's in Burlingame at the Hyatt Regency. Check it out. You got to go. Get yourself tickets. Get there early, March 7th. We will see you there. Be there or be one side of a board cube. That's a square. Hey, we did it. Thank you, everybody. Good night. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. STSF mm -hmm. coming soon. Real soon. So yeah. um, this is an episode, Ciroc, that I do remember. You know, a lot of these I don't even have the faintest memory of. This yeah. one I do remember. I don't remember how it ended. I don't remember what happened really but i remember this guy i remember the outrageous okana version two basically i feel like and then what there was a deep space nine episode that was like this too where there's a a rogue guy that escapes and he like falls in love with kira or something like that remember that guy and so yeah, when yeah. deanna troy went and started talking to him i was like i was like oh wait is this gonna be like she falls in love with the bad boy thing kind of like kira did with that one guy everybody in the comments below Please remind us who was that guy that showed up like Okana version three and was like, oh, I'm such a showed up in ops and was like, I'm such a tough guy. I'm such a dark, yeah. you know, edge lord. <laughs> and she's like in love with him or something. But I don't know. What did you think of this? What did you think of Roga Danar? He sure could fight. Man, he was kicking everybody's ass. He just need a couple of those guys. Uh, <laughs> I was like, that was I saw uh, Colomini. I was like, poor Colomini. He doesn't get into that many episodes. And when they we finally bring him back, and he gets his ass kicked in the uh, transporter room. <laughs> Can we talk about that battle scene? That was one of oh, the yeah. most typical Star Trek battles, melees. Let's call it a melee yeah. uh, I've ever seen because it had, you know. Uh, Chief O'Brien put him in like a wrist lock, which was pretty cool. I was like, whoa. And then the guy was like, he came at the two security guys and like what thought he was yeah. an offensive it, lineman. Like, and then they it, took it. looked it, like a WWF, like a whole WWF scenario. Like I was totally waiting for the top ropes to just <laughs> jump off and give him the <laughs> <laughs> Well, actually, you know. uh, funny you should say that because the uh, stunt coordinator's assistant on this episode was Randy Macho Man Savage, everybody knows. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Who yeah, everybody was, knows. Uh, His brother was Leaping Lanny Poffo. Leaping Lanny Poffo was Randy Savage's brother. Yeah, I don't think life. everybody knows that. <laughs> <laughs> But no, I, I actually enjoyed this episode. It was um, it was very clever. And one of the things that was appealing to me was how this Roga Danar guy was able to outsmart the Enterprise. Uh, pretty much this collective group of, you know, the smart smartest people in the Federation or one of them. 
and including data who is, you know, a, a walking computer. So the fact that he was a step ahead of them, always deceiving them, always kind of outmaneuvering the the Federation or the, in this case, the Enterprise, that was um, interesting to me. And it kept it made for an episode where I couldn't predict what was about to happen. I didn't know what was going to happen in this episode. Yeah, and it was uh, it was cool that the TNG crew was figuring out his methods, his strategies, but he was still staying ahead. Like, remember the second time he tries to ram the ship or he does whatever, but. Data says something like, I've ex extrapolated his strategy from past uh, experience or from past whatever. Mm -hmm. And so that was cool because it shows it's not just this guy's just doing the same trick and they're, they keep falling for it. He does a trick. It works. He does it again. They don't fall for it. They catch him. But then he's still a step ahead. He's still, you know, moving, which is great because mm -hmm. that's in the game of life, in the game of chess. That's how things work. You know, you you have to keep adjusting your strategy because they're going to figure out the patterns so i thought that was probably the best aspect of this episode personally yeah and uh, you know one of the things that kind of i was reminded of was not too long ago in the news i would say less than five years ago which is well after this episode aired but less than five years ago I recall hearing in the news somewhere that there were there was an attempt to make these genetically modified soldiers, whether they were in I, I believe it was the Chinese was were being accused of it hmm. at the time in the headlines, but somebody was being accused of a pro, of of developing a program to make better soldiers. Super like soldiers. this genetic modification, super soldiers, yeah. Mm. And um, I, I, that I was reminded of that as well, watching this episode. Yeah, it's, that's interesting because, you know, every country will tell you that's what they do. But, you know, what we're talking about is on a completely different level. But that's what, you know, they say, you know, they break you down to build you back up. And so they're they're basically trying to turn you into a, a killing machine you know you need to be cold mm -hmm. and calculated and you know the, these you know militant people will tell you that when they're in a military situation they have to they have to like kind of turn off all that extra stuff and just be super focused where they're just like you know precision accuracy they have to be cold they have to be computer like <clears throat> and calculated um and there are a lot of people that are not able to do that kind of thing uh you know they they let emotions get in the way they can't make split second decisions they have fear like we all do and that's why you know they need to be programmed in their estimation is to eliminate all that stuff so yeah i could believe it it sounds vaguely familiar what you're saying um, but these guys aren't just mentally and emotionally, but, but physically, you know, he's an amazing fighter as evidenced again by just to finish up on that battle scene, because I, I was <laughs> like, I was like, this is the most Star Trek battle scene I've ever seen because you've got the, you know, you've got the hammer lock, you've got, you know, the guy, he's taking it outside. They're, they're going in another battle. They have phaser shots. Everybody always gets shot in the shoulder. No, I want to see somebody get yeah. shot in the face and be like, oh, you know, like, but it's always in the <laughs> shoulder. Sometimes like right here around the kidney area. And then apparently his weapon is on stun too. So that's fine. And O'Brien's okay. And then, and then Worf goes, runs in, tackles the guy. But he tackles the guy with and has the guy land on top of him i'm like that is very considerate of warp where it's like i want to tackle <laughs> this guy that's killing people but i'll presumably. break your fall but yeah but i want to land at on the bottom so that you don't get hurt i don't want to 
harm you. I want to make sure that. Yeah. And then data or no Riker yeah. rolls on top of him too. And I was like, this is the the funniest. This is the most Star Trek battle scene. I wanted to watch it like five times, but I didn't have the time for it. Uh, yeah. It was just, it was amazing. I wanted to watch it in slow motion oh, and hear like the Benny Hill music on it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that was an interesting um, battle scene. I, you know, one of the things that, really wasn't explained too much was how he was impervious to the the stun gun i guess the settings were too low or whatnot is that what they were trying to allude to or something yeah i i don't really i mean that the stun remember he had a gun too that didn't do anything to o'brien so his stun was set to really low so he wasn't trying to hurt anybody and then o'brien but they could turn it up a little bit to where it's like you're not killing him, but you are actually knocking him out. I thought that was kind of the point of those things, right? That's what I thought, too. <laughs> but apparently he was resistant to that, so they didn't really get into explaining that too much. But you would think that that kind of enhancement or technology, because this, this civilization didn't seem to be more advanced than the Federation. They actually presented them as less advanced than the Federation, right? Yeah. They they talked about our capabilities. We don't have the capabilities to retrieve him because he's, you know, somehow caused too much havoc and their ships don't travel at warp speed or, or in particular when he was in. So my assumption was that this, the Angosians were like, more behind technologically than mm -hmm. the Federation. Which yeah. is interesting because this medical enhancement of this soldier would be a display of a higher level of sophistication or technology than the Federation, at least to some degree, than, than we are currently aware of. So I thought there was a little bit of a contrast in that. Yeah, that's an interesting point. And uh, that's something that's really cool about i guess real life but certainly in star trek is that you figure societies evolve technologically differently based on what they think is a priority to them for example uh in ronald d moore's new show for all mankind everybody go check that out even though i haven't um but it's really good <laughs> by all accounts i've seen the first episode it's excellent yeah. And we know he's an amazing writer, is that the premise is that uh, what if the space race never ended? The space race of the 50s and 60s between the USA and the USSR, right? What if it never ended? In this, uh, you know, different universe, alternate universe, if it never ended, then the Americans and the Russians were still forever fighting in the space race, which would mean that more resources would go into it more 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 and then it wouldn't just have ended when the usa landed on the moon in 69 uh then they would have done that and then russia would have been like okay we're they're going to be the first to land on mars then and then in like 75 they actually land on mars and then we go okay well we're going to be the first to do you know and then it's just going to keep pushing so that at this point in 2024 we'd be yeah. doing crazy stuff that we're not doing now but we wouldn't have the same medical advancements. We wouldn't have the same, you know, social media advancements. We wouldn't have the same societal advancements because we're putting our resources into something else. So maybe in this case, these guys, it's a, it's kind of a similar thing to where they are evolving differently based on needs, based on wants, based on goals. But also, I agree, they're they're behind the, the Federation. Clearly, they they seem to be behind in most ways and then they have and they look like humans though i was going to ask you that actually do you think the uh they gave the makeup department the week off or this alien race yeah yeah they were like <laughs> the part of them that looks alien is underneath the clothing so 
That's, I see. That's the explanation for that. <laughs> uh, they are the seven belly buttoned race. I, I've heard <laughs> yes. of them. I forgot that's these guys. Yes. Angosian yes. means seven belly buttons in Angosian. <laughs> yes. The Angosian uh, umbilical cords <laughs> are a delicate, delicacy in, uh, you know, certain planets. But I, I did find an article <laughs> dated in 2020. And it did say the future U.S. military super soldier may be closer than we think. So I did say about five years ago. Oh, wow. Yeah. And this this was actually talking about the U.S. super soldier. And to quote this article, it says the paper, the paper discussing this particular topic, the paper discusses the Defense Department Biotechnologies for Health and Human Performance Council, BHPC study group that looked at emerging tech that could enhance human biological abilities across many areas of interest to the defense department these included technological enhancements to vision hearing muscular control and direct neural enhancements of the human brain for two-way data transfer so this is something that's been discussed recently like i said in the last five years when it comes to super soldiers so here's my question how do i opt into all of that without joining the military because that sounds great <laughs> you want better hearing and muscular yeah. control and vision i got yeah i got like you know i gotta wear contact lenses i gotta do all these things what i don't want thank you very much u.s government or chinese government or whatever is doing this what i don't want <laughs> is increased smelling ability i already <laughs> smell humans enough I don't need more. Thank you. In uh, fact, dulling it a little bit might be just fine. I hold my breath every time somebody walks by me at the gym, just in uh, case. <laughs> but otherwise, well, that sounds pretty good. <laughs> that's that's funny. Uh, but I, I would I wouldn't mind the dulling of the smell, but I would want the increasing of the taste buds because taste buds are valuable for a good meal. Yeah, but then then we turn into foodies. And then we turn, that's, can get really, that can be really bad. <laughs> it can get real dangerous real fast. Can you imagine if you're eating chocolate cake and you're just like, oh my God, this is the greatest thing I've ever had. I want to eat it 50 times right now. Well, you'll need an enhancement for calorie uh, burning. <laughs> Add that to the list. All right. That works, actually. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah no this is a this was a good episode you know the thing that i really noticed too is um the acting was was really good in this episode i thought this jeffrey mccarthy was 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 really good at playing a, con a conflicted character that had a goal but also was communicative uh communicative with mm -hmm. different people um, there was a balance there where I saw him as a villain, but then I started to unsee him as a villain. And I thought that's a great performance because it's, it's a very fine line performance wise as an actor to be able to pull that off where I don't fully hate you or I'm supposed to hate you, but I don't because of how you grow on people and, and, and how you state your case for what your motives are and, 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 you know, what's your guiding kind of principle. So that was a good job by Jeffrey McCarthy for this particular episode. I thought he did a great job of walking that line of, you know, being somebody that you're supposed to fear and kind of loathe to becoming somebody that you're almost rooting for to some degree. I almost thought that Picard was going to let him escape. You know, there was part of me that was thinking, oh, is, is Picard going to feel some type of way and say, you know what? You know, there's a shuttle bay, too, is open if you just happen to. <laughs> no, you know? don't go to shuttle bay, too. That's the only <laughs> one we've left unguarded. Don't you dare. <laughs> exactly. That. Yes. There was a part of me thinking maybe they'll try to let him get away because they believe in his cause. But that would also mean that other people were going to die if they did assist him in letting people get away without you know and just say all right that's no that's none of our, none of our business we'll move on the fact that they kept involved uh gave a great resolution to the episode um which is this kind of 
this forced meeting of the two disputing parties. And th that, that made sense for me too. So uh, as far as logic was, was, was concerned, the episode played out logically to me. Yeah, I agree. In fact, uh, I wanted to add something to that where I was like, my little nerdy nitpicky brain was like, well, now hang on a second. But then I thought about it. I was like, no, they got that right. That worked. But I'll tell you what that is after our break, everybody. <laughs> oh, it, it was. You're, you're right. It it played out logically. Uh, yeah. Robin, the writer, Robin uh, Bernheim. Berner. Yeah. Kind of mapped it out well, I thought. Uh, so let's take a yeah. quick break and we will be right back. Oh, forgot to say, we might have a special treat for you all after the break as well. We'll be right back on The Seventh Rule. Hey, everybody, welcome back to The Seventh Rule with Ciroc Lofton. Yeah, hello, hello. Well, would you look at that? We have an amazing special guest today. What a treat. It is Jeff McCarthy. How are you today, Jeff? I'm doing very well, thank you. I'm, it's, it's, I'm, I'm pleased and proud to be here. Well, we are very happy. People right now yeah. are saying, whoa, is that Roga Danar, the one and only <laughs> actual? Yes, it is him. So uh, we're super excited for this. Uh, we can't wait to get into uh, this conversation. So let's not wait. Do you remember the process of auditioning for this role? Were you a Star Trek fan ahead of time? Were you like, this is it? I can't wait. I'm super nerdy. I love Star Trek. I can't wait to get into this. Or were you like, yeah, it's another job, and I nailed it? It was another job, but I watched the first episode with my father. He loved the original Star Trek. I didn't really watch the, um, this was what, was this the next one after the original? Yeah. Next, yes. Yeah. But this was the third, ep the third uh, um, season. Third episode of, of Next Generation. I wasn't really familiar with it, but it was amazing to walk the sets and see all the Star Trek junk, you know, that was around there. That was an amazing <laughs> Patrick Stewart and Marina Sirtis and all that. That that was a great, great honor. Yeah. And I ran into her at a uh, party about two months after we shot this and was blown away to learn how cockney she is. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> that really amazed <laughs> But Patrick, I would see him around town at parties and stuff, and he was always very friendly. He was great. Yeah. I want to compliment you, uh, Mr. McCarthy, on the performance that you give in this episode. Um, I think it, your performance carried the episode, made it very believable. Um, I thought you played the conflicted person that you were in this episode really well. There was moments where I was cheering against you in the beginning, and then I kind of went towards your side by your argument. Good, good, good. And you know who cast me in this? The creator of Star Trek. Well, what's his name? Gene Roddenberry. Gene, Gene Roddenberry? He was at the audition wow. and the call, and he chose me personally. So, yay. <laughs> That's he's still yeah. You guys no, know? He, no, he's, he's passed away. Yeah. Mm hmm. But oh, you, you really do. A, in fact, yeah. But that's really yeah. that's really amazing. If yeah, the creator that <laughs> yeah has picked. picking you, saying that's the guy I want. Do you remember yeah. what you did that was special about it, or did it this wow. did this just feel like a role that was made for you? I'd done I'd done uh, uh, Les Misérables in L.A. and that got me a lot of attention. And it, I think it was shortly after the run of that. So I don't know whether Gene had seen that uh, show out at the Schubert or what, but it was, no, I, it was just a regular old audition and thank God I got it. And the costume designer, Bob Blackman, was mm -hmm. an old friend from ACT in San Francisco. So he, you know, when I went to the fittings and everything, he and I were old, great old friends. And that was a wonderful part of it, yeah. Oh, wow. I love Bob Blackman, he's a legend uh, in this business. And I mean, the gold standard of of costume designing, in my opinion, and he's done uh, all of it, right the movies and everything. I think, yeah, a lot of it, a lot of it. Um, just amazing uh, talent. But you know, back to your performance. You know, this episode 
you know, you're playing this super soldier, this genetically altered soldier who has been kind of removed to a penal colony kind of as punishment for being what you've been asked to be. And, um, and the idea of being in this kind of isolation and this kind of a, a prison, even though it's a, you know, supposedly comfortable prison, um, but still a prison nonetheless is what begins your motivation to become rebellious in this episode and, um, it, you know, try to, you know, fight for your existence and for life. You, you mentioned that there was no way you wanted to return back to captivity. So this was an existential threat for your character. It was very much um, returning Vietnam vets from Vietnam. Mm -hmm. You know, they were mm -hmm. treated like garbage when they came back because they were yeah. messed up by being in the military and being shot at and everything. It screwed with their brains. So that's what this episode was about. And I was very proud to be part of that. That's for sure. Uh, that, that's what I, I, I wanted to identify and what resonated with me, because there are circumstances in which we find that this is the way uh, veterans are treated, uh, you know, as kind of marginalized and outcast and and yeah. not included into society because of the experiences that they were asked to to perform. Yeah. Um, so I think that was one of the big things that, you know, this post-traumatic, you know, stress that you were dealing with. And how you were performing this internal struggle of we know you're a good guy, but you're really forced to react to these unnecessary uh, kind of inflicted circumstances. Um, yes. Really great performance on your on your part. Um, I just wanted to make sure I, I got that compliment out. <laughs> With Marina Surtees was was uh, helpful. <laughs> oh yeah, she's just yeah gorgeous and charming and all that so i mean that anyway i'm 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 minimizing what you're the point you're making you know well but the other thing is too is we don't see in many cases on star trek where the guest star has such a large role it is essentially right. the main feature of the story you are the a story and i don't even know if there's a b story no nope. um uh, so yeah, yeah we don't we don't see in cases where you're getting more responsibility than the lead of the show i think you're in more scenes than Patrick Stewart. So uh, that what, what's what's that like walking on to a season three of a show sci fi and now you're like literally the lead of the show. Well, as I said, I, I hadn't been watching the series that much, so I didn't think of it in those terms. I just thought, well, I have this great guest star role and I'll make the most of it that I can. But um, I wasn't aware that it was such a huge role relative to other episodes. Mm. Yeah. And it was it was great. Yeah, I, I really, I had a great week there, that's for sure. Now, Jeff, it's uh, widely reported that the Next Generation set had a lot of shenanigans. Did you see any, dare I say, giggles, which should not be permitted on any set under my watch? Did you see any any laughter or giggles or fun, or was everybody just kind of professional and, and kept minded to their P's and Q's? Very professional. I don't remember giggles or anything. <laughs> they compared the 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 thing that I was flying in. It, it was made out of a uh, 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 a big razor. <laughs> yeah, actually, that they enhanced it, but it was it was a a razor, and and I remember learning that, thinking, no kidding, my God, wow. <laughs> so no, but wow. other than I don't remember any giggles or anything. Mm -hmm. All right. <laughs> yeah, uh, and then and then so they bring you back um to do Star which is another kind of hallmark signature of Star Trek is when they find somebody that they like they they usually bring them back to do something else on a, another show or the same show in a different character and this happened in your case as well. Can you tell well, us about Voyager? Mm -hmm. Do you guys know Jeff Combs, Jeffrey Combs? Oh actor? yeah. Good friend. Yeah, he's old and money. He's one five or six <laughs> roles on there i think yeah yeah he's been everything i i just came back and did the pilot of voyager which was a great honor yeah so here is yeah. that image right here that's you as uh the chief medical officer of voyager the official chief medical officer on voyager's maiden voyage until you and 
a few others uh, died. Uh, there's Oops. Lieutenant Scotty. Right the What's his name? He's I, I know this guy. He we, he played the first officer in that episode. He also died. I don't remember the character name. I can check though. Either. We were we did a couple different TV series together, and we were friends. We would go and drink occasionally. Yeah, and I can't while think of his I, name. While I look 30. that up, can you tell us uh, any combat training you had? Because that was a little bit of combat. You guys were rolling around. There was a big Worf fight. was diving on top of you. Riker was it was yeah. crazy. Do you what yeah. kind of combat training do you have? I did quite a lot of it at ACT in San Francisco when I was there in their uh, master's program, and we did a lot of combat training then. But I'm also I was a big athlete. I pole vaulted and high jumped and ran uh, cross country. I was I, I was and played basketball and all sorts of things. So it wasn't hard for me to do those fights and such. But I did have a stunt double in in that fight that you see in the episode at one point. It's not me. It's somebody found that looked like me. So anyway, yes, I, that's combat training. So, yeah. Wow. So you're a physically fit guy. That actually, that came across to me too, because there's moments where you're standing opposite, uh, Jonathan Frakes, who himself is a, you know, fairly burly and, 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 and large guy. Um, but you could tell that, you know, you, you're holding your own size wise amongst these guys that are pretty big. Yeah. And there was a guy in the fight that we had, there's the one actor, he was a regular on the show and he was also at ACT with me. And I, and I can't think of his name because this was 35 Oh, years Worf? Ago. Worf, Michael Dorn? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. He was at ACT yeah. training program, I think the year behind me or something, but anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, and how the, often do the scene who, who played the uh, the equivalent to uh, Spock? He 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 was in Brent Broadway. Spiner. Brent, yes, yeah, he was in mm, some yeah. George, and I, I never worked with him prior to that. But he, we both came from the musical theater on Broadway, so yeah, Brent, right. So you had this kind of connection with so many different people on that show then already. Yeah. yeah. It, it helped me relax, you know, and all that. So, yeah. You know, I'm bummed. I still can't find the name of this first officer. IMDB <laughs> might not have it, but I'm still checking. And we still have you for a few more minutes, Jeff. Can you tell us, by the way, besides all this Star Trek goodness, are you working on anything currently? I am. I'm going to London on April 27th to play William Kunstler, uh, a role that was written for me in a play called Kunstler. He was a very famous civil rights attorney. And we're going to go and do it there for almost three weeks. And then my oldest friend from childhood is coming out. We're going to Liverpool to explore Beetle country, you know, and all that after that. But I just did a work opposite, uh, not opposite, Dolly Parton's the life story of her. And she was there and we got along really well. And <clears throat> we took pictures the last day and she said, Jeff, I will see you very soon. And it's like, that's what you want to hear from Dolly Parton. So, yeah. <laughs> all about age six all the way up to what she is now, which is she just turned 78, you know. She's wow. amazingly wow. Old and doesn't play star or anything. She's just a totally accessible, you know. So, yeah, okay. so that's coming the next year or so. Scott Joke. Scott that's it. Joke is the yep. fellow that played uh, First Officer, who was Lieutenant Commander uh, Javik, was it? Uh, something like that. Scott, joke, yeah. yeah. Have it. That's a, anyway. his name. It's been years since I've <clears throat> thought of him, so, yeah. Wow. Yeah, well, I, uh, uh, <laughs> sorry, go ahead, Sirach. <laughs> no, I just... I, you know, I've seen you in so many things. I, I remember RoboCop too. I had to bring that up again, but you know, I loved <laughs> you in that. <laughs> um, do people ever come up to you and and you know recall your experience on Star Trek, saying, "I remember you from Star Trek"? Yes, they they have several times, and they want they have uh, technical questions, and I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> what makes this happen? What makes this? Why does the thing have? Uh, reverse thrusters and all this. I'm like, I don't. <laughs> my department. <laughs> but yes, people recognize me from that all the time. It's true. Oh, that's oh, great. One quick correction. It looks like his uh, Scott's last name is Jake. 
Jake, not uh, Joe. It's J A E C K. Uh, however you oh. pronounce that. Uh, yeah, that, that. Yeah, yeah. So Scott, Jeff, yeah, yeah. you are extremely memorable, uh, and that's why people come up to you. That's why people they say, "Wait a minute, I know you." Do you ever go to Star Trek conventions and uh, just I'm... sit there and just smile and be like, "Here I am." You guys know, you know who I am. Yeah, I would love to do a two or you know. I thought that they would, would invite me and, oh, shoot, they might have years and years ago, but I was busy doing something else, I think, to go out on a cruise ship or something. I have a vague memory of that. But uh, that that uh, Star Trek, the cruise has yeah. just returned. They usually go from the end of February to the beginning of March. This year, they went from February 22nd or 3rd to 29th. Uh, but wow. that's that's what it is. So maybe they'll get you next yeah. time. The end of February for the Star Trek cruise number eight, maybe it is. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Mm -hmm. Well, well, Jeff, this has been really cool. We were talking all about you uh, just in the segment before. We can't wait to talk about you more. What were you saying? Sorry. You almost called me Scott, Jake. I did. I was because I still had (laughs) Scott on my mind and I was looking at his name and I was trying to figure out how to pronounce it. And I'm like, wait, I need to focus on what the heck I'm doing right here. But yes, you are you are right, Jeff. But uh, we will never make that mistake again, and we will call you Jeff or Roga. If that's okay with you, uh, <laughs> or Lieutenant Commander Cavett. Uh, but thank you so much, Jeff. This has been really cool. We really appreciate you hanging out with us. We want to wish you all the best of luck and break as many legs as you can uh, playing your new role, which is a super exciting one, uh, playing a civil rights attorney and. Uh, needs to be done all over America. It's all about civil rights and, you know, with Black Lives Matter and all that, it's it's more relevant and resonant than it's ever been, especially if you know who is running for the Republican Party. Mm-hmm. And I won't mention it. <laughs> uh, I'm going to pull up the picture of this uh, William Kunstler as well so everybody can recognize him. Uh, this is who you will be playing. And you're right. You do have a bit of an air uh, to you. It's not. It's not too far off. So you're gonna. You're said you're growing your hair out. If we ever shoot a film of it, I will. Uh, wait a uh, minute. Shave. That's, actually, has, that's actually you. <laughs> I was like, wait a minute. This yeah. is, it's, it's actually it's you. Too, it's too close. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That's well, great. thank you very much, Jeff. We really appreciate you taking the time. This has been a lot of fun, and uh, talk with you soon, hopefully. And we definitely hope to see you at a convention or a cruise very soon stick around for just a second here thank you very much you, everybody sorry send me an email when this is going to be online or wherever it's going to play on television absolutely or whatever. absolutely sure. we'll uh, definitely love to have you watching it uh everybody stick around we will be right back with a lot more coverage of this awesome episode on the seventh rule hello everybody welcome back to the seventh rule with Sirach lofton hello hello here come the trivioids of the week. Not a ton. There wasn't a B plot in this one, actually. It was very straightforward. Yeah. I mean, there was kind of a 1A plot, I guess, but here they are. Angosia 3 has expressed a strong desire for membership in the Federation. Angosia 3 is a little stuffy for Riker's taste. A prisoner has escaped from a penal colony on Lunar 5. Roga Danar has no life signs. That was weird. Lunar 5 is a military prison. Roga Danar's first instructor called himself a counselor. And Roga Danar has killed 84 times and remembered 84 faces. That sounds torturous. Yeah. I mean, it's probably worse for the people he killed, but you know. <laughs> I guess that's. I would say so. He didn't really kill anybody when we were watching the episode, though. He was right. nice not to. Which brings me to the tease uh, at the end of the, the last segment, which is the consistency of this episode. Um, at the end, they said, oh, he he won't attack you. Felt like it was like an animal, like, or, or what are the thing? The Borg. It's like the Borg, right? They won't attack mm-hmm. you unless they think you are harmful. If you don't present them any harm, they won't attack you. Like, what is he, like a lizard? Shh, don't move. Yeah. They won't do anything if you don't. But 
but then you know so then he doesn't attack because they're like lower your weapons and he's like i can't attack if they don't it was kind of weird but then i tried to catch him i said well no because at the beginning first thing he does he jumps off the transporter pad and he double close lines security one and security two mm-hmm. but then i remembered well no wait they did lift up their phaser at him so that does work and i wonder mm-hmm. if they must have been very clear you know the writing team must have been very clear we need to include that we need to show that when he transports they raise their weapons at him so he felt threatened and like a mm-hmm. rattlesnake if he feels threatened he has to strike and so that all worked and i kind of was like cool because so- i sometimes i can't help it i get a little nerdy nitpicky you know like all the the star trek fans and i go well actually he didn't and it's nice when star trek goes ah uh, ah uh, ah uh. we did have that covered go go back in your notes and check we we handled that <laughs> Yeah, my my nerdy nitpick, which I never got an answer to, was how he was able to escape being beamed. Because they were they were right. beaming him. He was in mid beam. He looked like he was fighting against the beam. Like you know, he can't beam me, and then disappeared. I'm like, well, where the hell is he? <laughs> you know, it's like. So that was my nitpick that I couldn't I couldn't I couldn't fit that together. I was like, well. Right. What, because what, what what genetic modification could resist you being transported from point A to point B? I don't know if that's possible. Right. Well, the reason you couldn't piece that together is because they never explained it. Yeah. <laughs> they, they didn't cover that. They're like, oh, that just... Uh, that happened, but don't worry about it. It reminds me of when I moved into a house several years back. And uh, I was doing a walkthrough with the landlords and I said, oh, this is the uh, the switch on the wall for like the heating and air and all that stuff. And I said, oh, it seems like it, it's not working. Does it work? And she says, oh, I was hoping you wouldn't ask that. And so I think Star Trek's like, oh, I, we're just hoping you wouldn't note it. We're hoping you wouldn't ask that. Don't, don't, yeah. we don't uh, let just let's not. Yeah, yeah. I I was definitely asking that. I'm like, well, what the hell kind of superpower does he have? Like, <laughs> if he has that kind of a power, then he could just disappear himself from the colony and find himself anywhere else he wants to be. Like, I, I didn't understand that exact part, but you know, there were other things that I thought I thought the language was good. Um, Picard had some of the better lines as far as that was concerned, but you know, when he says, "Even the most comfortable prison is still a prison." I, I, I thought totally. great line, great line. Um, I, I couldn't help but kind of uh, be reminded of certain things I have heard about how Gaza, the Gaza Strip is built and designed. I've heard people make comparisons to living in there is like living in a, an open air prison. And so no matter how well the accommodations are, how nice everything is, it's still a confined space where you're not allowed to go in and out of. And I thought I thought of that. Um, yeah. Plus, I, let's be honest, not to cut you off, but let's be honest. Uh, the dude shows up with like ripped shirts and he's got a tag <laughs> on his face. So I'm like, hey, yeah. I, I think it was more than just like, oh, well, it's beautiful out here, but it sucks that I can't le- like it. Like, I think he wasn't living too well, clearly. Although he did have yeah. a nice barber. I know. Yeah. And he had a great physique. So he was he was definitely working out. Um, and then the other line that I like was the mat- matter of internal security, the age-old cry of the oppressor. That was another Picard line. Well written. I think it it, mm-hmm. it, it rings true to a lot of degrees. A lot of times when you hear... You know, this is an internal security issue. That means it's like, you know, you're not in on this. You're not in on this. So we're not going to tell you because we don't have to tell you. And uh, yeah, so, th- so those were some of the other ones. The other line that I liked was when Roga, Roga Denar said, to survive is not enough. To simply exist is not enough. That was another great line that was like, Reminded me of like a Cisco line or something to that effect, where it was, 
that's powerful, just the words themselves. Ain't that the truth? I mean, taking away somebody's freedom is like, that's life, you know? And yeah. If, yeah. if, you know, if they are presumably taken well care of, you know, but clearly it doesn't look like they are, uh, as yeah. mentioned before, just the fact that they're stuck there is already a, a gigantic uh, diminishment of the, you know, life, uh, of the, the quality of life. And, you know, also, it, it, they kind of start explaining more and more that it's like, what did these guys actually do wrong? Nothing. They just, well, they, they, they did what they were told to do. And yeah, then they, they said, and followed then orders. basically like, and, and correct me if I'm understanding this right, because I'm not sure if I am, but basically they're like, okay, so we created these military monsters. They served their purpose. And then we gave them their own settlement because having them mix in with us kind of wouldn't work. They're kind of dangerous. They're kind of scary. They kind of don't really know how to work in our civilized life. We're a little stuffy. They're a little savage. We'll keep them over there. And then, because remember, he said it started off as a settlement, but then it progressively starts turning into a penal colony. And so, you know, what do they say? The the road to hell is paved with good and pre uh, uh, good intentions. Intentions, and yeah. so their good intentions were like, oh, we'll give them a nice home. We'll do this, you know. We'll, or at least what they think are good intentions. Well, us looking at it or can be very judgy and say, obviously, that's not good intentions. But they thought it wa it was, and then it kind of slowly evolves into a prison. Yeah, it's it's a it's a prison, um, and it's. It, it's an exclusion from society that it made me think of veterans too you know veterans that serve in the military that return home and they're like well you know you're kind of a killer so we don't want you walking around uh us normal family people and it's like well i signed up i did what you asked me to do i you know served honorably and then i come back and i'm not treated with 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 respect, with fairness, with any mm. kind of, you know, reverence for the, the the sacrifices that he made. Picard alludes to that when he says, your brothers, your sons, and you turn your backs on them. He's like, you know, these are your, these are not like some outsiders that you colonized or conquered. These are people that are your own blood. These are your own brothers, your own sons. So... I mean, that point resonated with me as well. Yeah, and I think that's 100% what this uh, what this episode was about. You know, each episode is is about kind of tackling something in a, in a not so veiled way. And, uh, you know, the allegory here was how we treat our veterans, which is, yeah, we turn them into killing machines. They come back traumatized. And we go, mm, that's kind of icky. I kind of don't want to deal with that. I kind of, uh, he's schizophrenic now. Uh, he's an alcoholic now. Uh, he's, she's kind of dirty now. Yeah, she's kind of trauma. Yeah. They and 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 it's and we, I get it. You know, we're all humans. We're all like, I don't want to deal with somebody that's scary or dangerous or annoying or weird or creepy or whatever. <clears throat> but we can't turn our backs on them. Not after what they've given to us. I mean, that is the that is the worst bait and switch you could ever do. Yeah. Hey, take care of us. We'll take care of you. And then flash to, thanks for that. Anyway, fuck off. <laughs> yeah, you can't live here with us, but you can live over there. Yeah. With you guys. No, no, not 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 that. Little for, farther. Little yeah yeah, yeah. over like over the there. other planet. The other planet, yes, <laughs> on the <that>. moon, <laughs> yes. So, no, I, I, I thought this episode really uh, hit a lot of sensitive spots for me. Um, again, I want to highlight Jeff McCarthy's acting in this, and you know who else was? You know, we didn't get into it, but James Cromwell um, did a fantastic job as well. I didn't realize how tall he is. Um, 
He's, you know? he looks ta- he's taller than than Riker, you know, and, and mm-hmm. Jonathan Frakes is, is a is a tall guy. You know, I should have actually led with that. Uh, I'm actually friends with Jamie Cromwell. He's he's an amazing guy. Oh wow. He is extremely tall. He says six six, but he's six seven. His son is a spitting image of him, uh, John, uh, also six seven, also an actor. Wow. And uh, I met Jamie Cromwell because we are both uh, really big into like animal rights and and environmental things like that. So I meet him at you know hippie animal rights functions, and he is so friendly, and he's so nice, and he's such a good guy, and he is so willing to get arrested for like the causes. Yeah. Like that's what these people. In fact, he and my mom, you know, kind of got arrested together. Uh, doing their, yeah. you know, freeing pigeons and things like that, you know, so it's, yeah. he's a really great guy. Uh, and it was great seeing him here. And I remember seeing him on Three's Company before. He also plays Zephram Cochran in uh, Star Trek First Contact. He also played an alien in Deep Space Nine. Mm-hmm. I can't remember the episode. Is it Starship Down on Deep Space Nine? Remember where he and Quark, was it, were... Was it that one? Anyway, he was in Deep Space Nine in an episode where he played an alien as well. Um, great guy. Great acting. Well, I remember him from the movie Babe. You know, yeah, that'll do, pig, right? That'll do, pig. That's I mean, that's legendary, that that movie. Um, while I was looking him up, I did find that he had gotten arrested with J.G. Hertzler with one of the famous photos of the two of them being arrested together, so... Beautiful. He likes to get arrested for the cause, which is an admirable thing for for a man to do. So I, the cause I, I is really... also a Deep Space Nine episode <laughs> title, by the way. Uh, yeah. yeah, so it was in Starship Down, and remember, he and Quark are having like they're they're like doing negotiations while there's like a missile in the ship, you know, and they're and, and Quark is like. You know, 50-50 chance we might blow up the ship or we might do it. And he's like getting all excited. He's like, oh, my God, this is so exciting. And they did the do the thing. But there it is. Yeah. Great episode. Very memorable. Uh, very good actor. Um, you know, just just added to the to the performances. Um, I noticed uh troy deanna troy's hair seemed bigger than it normally is in this particular episode i don't know if she's switched up the the hairdo but just seemed massive in the in the back and the whole thing i was like that's a lot of hair i did and it's funny (laughs) and it's funny because roga danar makes a a joke about it when he's kind of talking with her he says yeah a girl with long dark hair broke my heart several years ago so he actually highlights the fact that her hair is long and you know it's something that he can't avoid um you know recognizing so i I thought that was pretty interesting as well Hmm. yeah i didn't Um, notice but they they kind of mess around with her hair quite a bit i wonder if this was specifically for this episode or if it's just a new look that she's going to have going forward for a while yeah what about the mouthful that Dr. Crusher had in this episode <laughs> when she, she started rattling off that stuff? And I'm thinking this is only Star Trek has these words. Uh, I don't know if you wrote them down, but she was talking about the altered cell structure of this of uh, Roga. She mentioned crypto biolin and try Mars. Macro macro spenthal. I was like, what the hell was like? How do you reach? I didn't even touch those, but I did write down <laughs> tricortazine because they always say that one, and anastazine. Yeah. Uh, but I think Picard said that one. Those others yeah. were nuts. <laughs> they were just, they were just, and I look at, it and then they cut to uh, Riker looking like, yeah, yeah, I know exactly what you're <laughs> talking about. Crypto I mean, yeah, of course. He's like, you know, I, I. Had a feeling you were going to say that, yeah. <laughs> exactly. I got some in my drawer if you need some. <laughs> yes. Uh, I laughed at a moment, too, when uh, they're looking for Roga. He's he's somewhere in the ship. He's hiding. He's, you know, he's escaped the, everything, and they're, they're looking for him. The wharf is doing the whole, like, running down each hallway, like, you know, is he over here? Is he over there? 
and they uh, Picard says, uh, "Mr. Worf, he's over here. He's in the engineering. You know, he's in engineering." And they they cut to Worf with another security officer, and he says, "We're on our way." And he's like walking as casually as you could. Man, possibly walk. I put that in my notes so hard. I, I said he's strolling along. Him and security guy. Yeah. It's like he's kill, presumably killing people. Jordy's down there. He's by the yeah. warp core. And he's like, all right, well, we'll get there when we get there. But I am walking <laughs> at a regular. My doctor told me not to elevate my heart. <laughs> yeah, they just, what the hell? We're on our way. And total I thought, slow-mo. The Where's the urgency? How does Cliff let that get away? He's can't. He, he can't do that. There's no sense of urgency there, and I, I, I thought that's that was terrible for me. There were a couple um, other things that were like that too. Like, for example, we all know that Leonard Nimoy started saying "sensors" instead of oh, "sensors." <clears throat> yes. Then we got on the bridge. We what? had. Let me see. It was Wesley. Wesley then said "sensor." Yes. Then after that, Riker said, sensor, like kind of copying that. <laughs> yeah. But then Data says, uh, sensors, and then he says it right. I'm like, you guys are killing me. Like the android is the one that says it like <laughs> colloquial. And these are the guys saying it like a Vulcan. And then later on, at the end of the episode, Riker does like first officer's log, blah, 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 sensors. And he says it correctly. I was like, wait a minute. And I scrolled up in my notes. I'm like, didn't you just... <laughs> <laughs> I can't keep up. This is crazy. Uh, How many different times are they going to say, I want to see one of those mashups of like the same character saying sensors differently, you know, Riker saying sensors, yes. sensors, 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 sensors. Anyway, <laughs> like Omicron. Yeah. Um, I, I heard the sensors too. When Wesley said it in the beginning, like who pronounces it like that? What, what's going on here? Yeah, you know, and it just kind of it's it just it hit a note, you know, and it just didn't sound right coming from Wesley. But, uh, you know, we're already just about out of time, but we do need to jump into our home run. Yeah, I, I put it so funny that Worf and his pal are just strolling instead of running. <laughs> and then the and then Worf arrives in engineering. And remember, they're all out. They're knocked out. Worf arrives yes. in engineering. And they all wake up like his odor is so pungent. He's like <laughs> smelling salt to them. Like they're out. They're totally out when, yeah. when, the, when the guy's beating people up and sneaking around. Worf yeah. walks in and they're all like, oh, oh boy. <laughs> that was weird. Yeah. Anyway, The other thing timing. that was weird about that was Worf walks in. He sees like four people knocked out. But he only reacts when he sees Jordy. Jordy! Oh, shit. Thinking. My friend. The guy I <laughs> yeah, care about. Well, you're gonna step over the two other guys. Yeah, that watch are also it, Smith. Up. Stupid Smith <laughs> legs always on the floor in the way. <laughs> so who gets this uh, home run of the episode today? Oh, the home run goes to um, Jeff McCarthy, who plays Roga Daynar. Um, carried the episode, you know, a guest star coming in. Had the bulk of the the responsibility in this. I'm sure he did most uh, most days on the set out of everyone on this particular shoot. And I thought he held the episode. He exceeded. He did exceedingly well. Um, I believed not only that he was capable of those those fight scenes. He did seem like he was like you know didn't look like somebody who couldn't fight. He looked like somebody who knows how to fight. So that was believable. Uh, his performance was believable about this con conflicted kind of PTSD that he's going through from what he was programmed to do by you know his own government and then how he's trying to find a, a solution to that. I really like the, the line where he looks over at Troy and he says, I'd rather die than go back to uh, Lunar 5. He delivered that really well. Um, and yeah, I just think that Overall, he seemed like a good adversary for the entire Enterprise crew. Like he was, he he was challenging each and every uh, mind on that crew. Like Riker thought he had him. Riker was like, "Well, maybe he's going to do that." Uh, Picard was like, "Well, I think he might do this." And Data was like, "Well, 
I have been, you know, yeah. extrapolating his, his, you know, his movement. And I, I think he would do this. So everybody had a take on what they thought he might do. And he seemed to outwit and outsmart them all. So for that, uh, for that and the, and the performance itself, I thought he was also like the fact they didn't make it a love story between Troy totally. and his character. Didn't stay away from that. it. Yeah. They and I was afraid it, it was going to go in that direction. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I'm I'm really happy that they've shown a light on, you know, veterans and all that kind of stuff. I think that's a very responsible thing to do, and they did it responsibly. <clears throat> but of course, yeah, the home run today goes to Roga Danar. Uh, also that he did um mocap for if you uh you remember Street Fighter, he did like Roga oh. Flame and Roga oh. Fire. And uh yeah, no, he was also in a <laughs> Star Wars movie. Uh Roga one so oh, that was also very good but no he did a great <laughs> job i think jeff mccarthy nailed it and here are a bunch of people we'd like to thank even though they're shaking her, their heads right now in dismay <laughs> homer frizzell dr Anne marie seagull eve england out in wales yvette blackman tom tj jackson bay out in missouri titus moeller Dr. Muhammad Noor, Tierney C. Diekman, Anil O. Palat, Joe Balserati, Mike Gu, and Dr. Ooh. Stephanie Baker, Carrie Schwent, Faith Howell, Edward Foltz, My Live from Tokyo, The Matt Boardman, Chris McGee, Justin Weir, Jake Barrett, Henry Unger, Allison Leach Hyde, Leech Julie High. Manisfi, Marsha, Classic it. Schreier, Greg K. Wickstrom, <laughs> Jed Thompson, Dr. Susan V. Gruner, Glenn Iverson, the pun master, Dave Gregory, Grandpa One, a.k.a. Tim Baum, and of course, Jason Oaken. We'll see you on the flip side, everybody. We'll be right back on The Seventh Rule. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to The Seventh Rule. This is the free-for-all, everybody. Sirach Lofton, of course. Melissa Longo. Hi. We've got Jason M. Oaken here. And thank goodness, Grandpa One, a.k.a. Tim Baum, is here. My is live until... Oh, I see the background. Good one. We're in for a treat today. Faith Howell hanging out on the Enterprise D Bridge. Uh, Homer Freezy wearing his favorite Kenneth Mitchell shirt. God bless mm -hmm. Kenneth Mitchell. Uh, Chris McGee is wearing a Lay Low shirt. You can get that at the introvertedrepublic.com, just like Melissa Longo's <laughs> shirt. Oh, and my shirt is from the uh, Roddenberries. They've got a new album out, everybody. Go check out the Roddenberry Spock Lobster. And, of course, the Matt Boardman wearing his cool Under Armour shirt. Here it comes. <laughs> it is time for Jake Sisko Guesses the IMDb Score. Um... At first, I wanted to say Spock Lobster. D didn't Melissa, you were just saying something about lobster? Did, is that a name? Yeah, my, my YouTube ones. channel is Three Fat Lobsters. <laughs> Three Fat Lobsters, yeah. yeah. Here comes lobster again. I'm like, how many times can lobster and Star Trek <laughs> be associated with each other? But it's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I like this episode. Um, I thought the, the ending was really clever. Um, Picard really um, he showed a lot of leadership in, in those closing moments I will say this was an, a, a solid 8 of an episode mm -hmm. Sorak is like the hunted on a scale of 1 to 10 urinate does anybody else uh, have a guess that doesn't already well, know I was going to say the same thing but to avoid your saying that again I'm going to say 8.1 <laughs> <laughs> oh. I'm going to oh. say uh, when it first aired, probably in the sevens, now mid eights. There's mm -hmm. a lot of stuff that's happened in 30 years. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. anybody else have any guesses? Probably go high sixes, low sevens, 7.1. Okay. Seven six. I say seven six. All right. All bets are in. No more bets. It is a seven point five. Excellent work, the Matt. Yeah. All right. You might be right too, Grandpa One, where it was uh voted lower initially 
And as time progresses and maybe becomes more relevant, maybe it's getting higher and higher votes. So it'll be nice to go back and check on it through the years and see if it's going up or down. Uh, did anybody catch any non-appearance mentions? I did not. All right. No. Well, let's just get up into this thing then. Melissa Longo, start mm -hmm. us off on the right track. Please let us know what you thought of this episode. <laughs> well, while I was watching this episode, there was a moment where I thought, you know what? I really like Star Trek. <laughs> <laughs> uh, because I really like the way it exposes humanity. Um, and this one definitely did that. Uh, it, this episode also reminded me of a quote by Sir Thomas More, which says, for if you suffer your people to be ill-educated and their manner corrupted from their infancy, and then punish them for those crimes to which their first education disposed them, what else is there to be concluded from this but that you first make thieves and then punish them. And this, sh this episode highlighted that for me because if you first make soldiers and now you, then you punish them for what you created. So uh, I got a lot from this episode. Um, I was definitely rooting for Daynar to succeed. And um, yeah. That's pretty much what I have to say about this episode, except for for things left unsaid. I have some things for that too, um, but and I am actually glad that they use Counselor Troy in this episode as a counselor. <laughs> as a counselor, <laughs> who knew? <laughs> uh, great stuff. Thank you very much, Melissa Longo. Teasing some goodies for things left unsaid a little later. Jason M. Oaken is here with a cool background. What did you particularly think of this episode? Well, uh, not that I'm going to be a naysayer, but uh, for me, it's kind of a middling uh, episode of the third season. I think the, the aim is very high. I think the themes uh, absolutely uh, are, are more relevant now, perhaps, than there were you know, 20, 30 years ago. But I think the execution is lacking, and I think there are some uh, details that aren't exactly there. So when you read the script and the script looks and feels more exciting than when you see on the screen, something is a little off. I think what holds this together for me are certainly the themes, the performances, the scenes, especially the ones uh, in the uh, in the brig are the ones that hold the episode together. Again, the performances, I think, you know, certainly Marina had a lot more to do in it and she's really good in it. I think, you know, Jeff McCarthy is good in it. Even, you know, James Cromwell, although he didn't have much to do, he certainly played the part that he was hired to play. I mean, you do get the sort of bureaucrats uh, feeling from it. I think Patrick's good in this. But there are things that uh, feel off, and I'll talk about them later. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Interesting. Mm -hmm. Great stuff. Thank you very much, Jason M. Oaken. Grandpa One, a.k.a. Tim Baum, might know a little something or other about uh, veterans, which is what this episode is about. What do you think of this one? Um, to start off, uh, you know, 30-some years ago when I first watched it, I loved it. I thought it was very intense. Um, now, at almost 61, uh, having been through a lot, it was like, it was very prophetic. Um, you know, in this case, you know, governments want super soldiers to do whatever they need to be done. But once it's over, it's like, okay, we're done with you. And in this episode, they went to Luna 5, or was it Luna 4? But. Five. It was Luna Five. In my experience, you go to an underfunded, understaffed vet hospital. You did what we wanted you to do, but now we really don't give a shit about you. And I'm dealing with that right now. Uh, and I could see Maya. 
shaking her head. Um, it's, you know, thank you for your service. Now, you know, go away. We don't want to remember what you were involved in. And I honestly did not want to do this episode, but I decided to. Uh, but yeah, it's, um, you're thrown away like trash. Um, I don't care if you're homeless. Get a job. No. Help these vets out. There's 23 veterans a day that commit suicide. So, so yeah, that's my, but I really did, you know, the episode both 30 some years ago and now have meant a lot to me, but it meant more having spent my entire life in the military. So. I can imagine. Well, thanks very much, Grandpa One, mm. a.k.a. Tim Baum, for sharing great stuff. Um, Mai is live in Tokyo. What's up, Mai? you got a cool background. I bet you're going to explain. Yeah, it's the, the Vietnam War Memorial. Um, the, the episode should be called The Haunted, not The Hunted. It was, it's, 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 uh, it's an incredible one. And I'm really glad you're here today, Grandpa Lennon. Thank you for showing up. I was hoping you were here for, me for this one. Um, as spoken by one of my lifetime's great leaders, uh, never was so much owed by so many to so few. And as the second line on the Vietnam War Memorial in Washington, D.C. reads, it says, we honor and remember their sacrifice. Um, last week, reviewing yesterday's enterprise, I described a hero as one who can look death right in the eye and, and know that their sacrifice is what is right for the many. Mm -hmm. But can we honestly say that other than knowing that we like to have a day off work to celebrate their sacrifice, that we honor our own veterans? Some do, but too many do not. Too many do not. The sacrifices. Um, the sacrifices they made that, that last a lifetime, if that hero lives past the war, are innumerable and often terrible. Coming from the generation that I do, I would just like to say, don't simply watch a neatly packaged story about it on TV. Go out in person and make the life of that hero a little better by thanking them and letting them know that you know what they did for you. That's it. Great stuff. Thank you very much, My. That's why I have tremendous respect for people like Sirach Lofton and Tim Russ, who do mention charities like the Wounded Warrior Project and uh, things like that. Uh, the two of them seem to be championing those often, and I salute them for that. Um, Faith Howell is here. What's up, Faith? That was a tough one to follow, huh? Yeah. Uh, but you're on. <laughs> what did you think of this one? Uh, well, I'm going to be honest. I tried to watch this episode twice and I'm not sure I made it all the way through either time. Um, I did get enough to um, appreciate Denar and, um, you know, what was going on with him. I definitely growing up in Norfolk, Virginia, one of the largest military installations in our country, for sure, if not the world. Um you know, I, I see the parallels and I definitely see the challenges that, you know, a lot of our ser servicemen and women go through, especially when they get out. And, you know, I wish Tierney was here tonight to talk about, I know her husband is going through that now, um, you know, what that's like. And, you know, I, I can't imagine um, the the lifestyle of giving up that innocence, you know, it, it's, something of course that I thought about as as a young woman finishing high school but um you know I decided that wasn't for me and I mad respect to everybody that goes abroad or stays here and protects our country um the sacrifices that they make for their families and and for our safety and security in the world is really incredible and and really you know you guys have said it should be respected more than it is Read. Thank you very much, Faith Howell. By the way, that is not just the Enterprise D. That's the Enterprise D lower deck style right there. Ooh. 
<laughs> and it also looks like it's first season because it's got those kind of reclining seats in the front that data would kind of like be lounging in <laughs> all right yeah. uh homer freezy mm -hmm. is out somewhere in new yeezy with an amazing bookshelf behind him what do you think of this one so i hadn't watched it in a while and uh to me it's one of these episodes that you get caught up in and they zip by uh there are some that are a little bit more work to get through and i don't know if it's because there was just the a story or it's just the a story was so good and i, I think it's it's really about the a story being so good uh and what i noticed there were two things um and I'm not going to unfortunately be able to join the things on set, but I'll be brief either way. So first off, in the brig, you have Roga Danar and you have the mirror. Um, and it was a really good use of that device, I thought, because you really have the two people. You know, you have the conditioning that's been he's been put through to do this job as a soldier. And then you have the person that Deanna was able to see or to to feel if you will. Uh, and the other one was just, um, you know, I think that, and maybe Jason can speak to this later, I'm wondering about the budget for uh, wigs for the stunt doubles. Oh. <laughs> We're all waiting for an answer to that. Uh, well, that would be probably later, the second segment, I guess. Oh. Yeah. So I will tune in and see that once this airs. Ooh, boy, oh boy. Can't mm -hmm. wait for that. <laughs> All right. Banger. <laughs> uh, Chris McGee is up next. Chris, how are you? And what did you think of this particular episode? Doing quite well. Thank you for asking. And wow. Well, yeah. Well, I had some things to say about the allegory of this episode to veterans, but there's looking at it, at it now in my notes here, there's nothing more. I, I could possibly add to what Grandpa wanted in mind. Everyone else has already said, and so perfectly. Thank you so, so much, much for saying that. And as Melissa has uh, stated, I also appreciate that Troy is a central character in this episode. Yeah, as she said, doing her job as a counselor to help Danar get what he and the other veterans deserve. On a, <clears throat> a bit of a lighter note, um, Given that the these are super soldiers, you know, that are enhanced through drug therapy and psychological conditioning, I kind of wonder if this episode was at least partially influenced by the 1980 novel by Robert Ludlum, The Born Identity. Mm. Um, because the, in that, the, of course, the lead character is very much conditioned and psych psychologically as well as uh, uh, medically. Um, great seeing Zeph from Cochran. I mean, James Cromwell in his uh -huh. first Star Trek appearance <laughs> back before he became famous and expensive. I'm sure. Uh, there was mm -hmm. one, some kind of, in this episode. Oh, um, I didn't catch it. When Picard uh, was speculating on why Danar's life signs didn't register, he said, Could it be some kind of android? Ooh. And speaking of Picard, of course, there are so many, uh, Memorable quotes in this episode, most of some of them by Picard. And of course, my favorite is even the most comfortable prison is still a prison. Oh, yeah. Thank you very much, Chris McGee, the Dark Lord, showing us the light today. Uh, the Matt Boardman is up next. What's up, The Matt? What did you hey, think of this episode? Well, just to kind of echo what Melissa said, I love when Star Trek is a lens that we look through and examine humanity and examine our society. And one of the things that I find very interesting is that this was what early nineties and here we are 2024. And a lot of the issues that are talked about in this episode still exist today, not to get political, but we recently had something in the united states uh with, with congress involving the support of our veterans mm -hmm. and you know i it just it's it, it's good 
to have that lens, to have that light that we can shine on these issues that are that are important. Because I, it reminded me of, I know this that the, the the I guess the allegory for this is supposed to be the Vietnam War, but it reminded me of a a guy that my dad and I used to visit who was a World War II veteran, and I love World War II history. And a lot of the films that we we have regarding World War II romanticize that that aspect of the war. Uh, but I always remember talking with him, and and one of the experiences that he shared with me is that uh, he participated in Normandy, mm-hmm. and he talked about when he first got home, he was sitting in, in his uh, his parents' home, and his uncle's truck backfired out in the out in the yard and he immediately dove under the table and and that it was a it was a trauma that he had to to live with his entire life and uh, we were on a trip with him and when there again was another loud noise and and just to see his reaction to that and i i mean this is how many years past and he's a much older man and it still is something that affects him and so i i you know, no matter, no matter the age, no matter the war, no matter the person, they all matter, and they deserve respect, and they deserve our attention, and they deserve the right to be recognized and be not forgotten because of the things that they did and the the things that they went through. Great stuff. Thank you very much. The Matt Boardman. Uh, all right. Jake's final take. What do you think, Sirach? Any final thoughts? Yeah. Um, one of the things that this reminded me of is is how governments can do things that we don't agree with and i think section 31 revealed that in deep space nine what measures they were willing to take in order to accomplish their goals and in this particular episode the angosians are willing to take these steps and these measures in order to accomplish their goal of winning this war that's why they created these soldiers and i was reminded of one of the the, the, the lines of, uh, of the soldier's creed, which is to never leave a fallen comrade. And that's something that's that's always talked about, like never leave a, a fallen soldier behind. And, and to me, this is an example of leaving behind one of your comrades after they after they make that kind of a sacrifice. So it, it seems antithetical to what is preached as far as being a good soldier. Um, you know, I, I, I feel like there was, a, there was so much in this, but the, 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 the fact that we went from distrusting this character to rooting for this character, um, to me, it shows good writing. Um, and the reason why I love Star Trek is because it makes me think about things and reanalyze things and reassess. And that, that was one of the things that I think this episode accomplished really well. It, it, it forced me to think about right and wrong. It forced me to think about poor leadership. I think that the, the Cromwell character, Prime Minister Nayrock, when he gave the the very sad reasoning for why they hadn't tried to help these soldiers, like, oh, we did a research, you know, we <laughs> we did like a whole study, we did a questionnaire, yeah. we filled out a questionnaire, and it came back that probably wouldn't work. So, and that's like without even that's like zero trying and zero effort. And um, I thought that was a poor excuse, and it, it, it it's. It's an example of just poor leadership uh, in general and lack of effort. Um, but yeah, that's that's my take. Excellent. 
totally agree. I bet everybody's going to get mm-hmm. whiplash from nodding in agreement. Uh, well, thank you very much to the Matt Boardman, Chris McGee, Grandpa One, uh, Homer Freezy, Faith Howell, My Live in Tokyo, Jason M. Oaken, and Melissa Longo for hanging out with us. We're going to talk a lot more in Things Left Unsaid, everybody. But if you're not a patron, you'll never know what we say. And it's going to be good, good, good. I cannot believe it. Uh, well, for myself, Sirach Lofton, Aaron Eisenberg, and Melissa Longo, say a prayer for the Kenneth Mitchell family. Yeah. And uh, we'll see you next time. Until then, always remember the seventh rule.